Let's go ahead and grab your seat. We're getting going. We're getting started. All right. All right. Look, this is what I love because it's like pretty cats to get you guys. You're still networking, but you just did it from a seating position. Love it. All right, you guys. All right, two things. Three books are going to be given away. You guys know that it's always a labor of love for me to figure out how to give them away. Um, and I've delegated that to, to Adam tonight. A um, few things, you guys. Um, Adam is a dear friend of mine. Um, he is someone who, him and his father, I've learned a ton from. So this is a great one. If you, if you brought something to take notes with, if you don't, pull out your phone. Um, there are some things that Adam shares. For example, what he shared earlier about the mobile homes. That is something, if you just take it and put it into, to, into practice, into use, I promise you these things will give you, um, it's meat and potatoes type of stuff, okay? So with that being said, um, Adam, come on up. So Adam, um, let's go ahead and share.
some of you guys know, I shared when he was on the Bigger Pockets podcast, Steve Train's podcast. Um, without further ado, look, Adam's a good guy um, who does good business. So don't get the three books. I'm busy giving away the first one. Uh, real quick, how many of y'all go to church? I'm guessing the back row, a lot of y'all. Oh, we're about to have that type of meeting. <laughs> I see everybody that doesn't have a mask on, clearly you're not terribly concerned. Why don't you move up front? Oh, that's not a joke, by the way. Get out of your seats and come up front. Did you, hey, here's the thing. Did you come here to learn all you can? Then come up front. Let's go. All right, so here's the question for the first book giveaway. So I, I had the privilege of meeting Harvey McKay, and he is the godfather of networking. Um, he's got a really good book on networking. It's called Dig Your Well Before You're Thirsty. And it talks a lot about networking. And I got to see him in action one day in Las Vegas. It was incredible the amount of research he would do on somebody that he wanted to meet. And he would literally find out everything about them before he ever said hello. And it was, I mean, it was mind-boggling the details that he went into. So uh, there's a couple things tonight. Obviously, Everybody's here to learn. I'm really excited to, that, that you came out. Um, we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to talk about some things that most people don't talk about. Um, but first, if you're not paying attention tonight, you're not going to get what you came here for. And sometimes what you're listening for is in the itty-bitty details. Um, so, Harvey McKay book, Master Networker. Let's talk about paying attention. So, Courtney said she met... Were you about to say something? Uh, no, I was just going to say, I know, I know some networking still continuing. Uh, I was going to give him the microphone, but he said, no, nah, no, nah, I'll make the move up like in church. And so um, pay attention, you guys. He's got some good things to give. We're, and hopefully we'll have a lot of fun tonight. But I do want to ask you all. So Courtney met somebody at a meeting, and they got to underwrite an apartment complex in Alabama. How many doors was it? 204. Nailed it. <laughs> Thank you, it's very important to pay attention to the little details. You would be surprised at how many times we have made or lost a deal because we either picked up on the smallest of details or we completely missed it. Right? So that's number one tonight. But I do want to talk about the, the lessons that nobody really talks about. Um, my goal here tonight is not to teach you any new little tricks or techniques to get you more deals in the next few weeks. It's not. And I know that that's always uh, a little bit, almost, I would say counterintuitive, because I think most people show up, they want to know, all right, what can I learn to go put to use next week? I want to get two more deals next week. Let's, let's go pick up that one little trick that'll get us those two extra deals next week, right? That's not what I'm here for tonight. Tonight, I want to focus in and, and really hone in on a few principal things that will set you up for a lot of success throughout your investing lifetime. Not just to get you a few more house deals, but to just make you more money on deals in general. How many of y'all do stuff outside of real estate? Your networking tonight is not just about real estate. Don't overlook it. All right, so here's what I want to go through first. Um, I know Courtney did a little bit of an introduction. I'm Adam Johnson. I've been around real estate investing all my life. Um, better part of 19 years I've been doing it, um, really active in it. Um, I think I'm coming up, I need to go back and count. I should be knocking on the door of about a thousand deals now. Um, you know what? I, fin I forgot to finish the Mima Cottage story. What's the What's the importance of the Mima Cottage, of the um, deals you were, the amount of deals you're doing per year, and what was your what access of tools did you have? So I, I think that was the funny thing. In twenty, sort of in twenty seventeen, I did forty three deals. I worked about seven months, and I didn't have internet at my house. I didn't have internet, I didn't have any kind of fancy tools, I had a cell phone, I had a computer with Excel spreadsheets on it, I thought I was moving up in the world. From your note, from your legal notepad. From my little yellow pad, um, and I wrote handwritten letters on those yellow pads. I would sit up at night, 
And I would just write them out and leave the address blank. And I'd mail out 150, 200 a month and get a very targeted list. I'd get about a 20 to 22% response rate and we were knocking deals out. And that's a very, I'm glad you brought that up because that's one thing that everybody needs to know is this does not have to be complicated at all. In fact, sometimes the more complicated you make it, the more complicated you make for yourself. Like that's mm -hmm. just all there is to it. If the tools you're using aren't making it easier and more efficient, it's not worth it. Keep it very simple, focus on the activities that make you money, and I'll go ahead and tell you what those two things are. If you're gonna write something down, see some of y'all with notebooks, I'm gonna tell you the two most important things you can do in this business. Find people to go talk to and go talk to them. Mm -hmm. You know that's, what? That's when when we did that first, um, when I did that uh, ride along with you, I don't know, two years ago, um, I was like, hey, can I come up and do a ride along with you? Because, you know, I was just starting to, I was starting to uh, expand and I was like, man, I'm trying to get all these things. And my biggest takeaway from 12 hours with you or whatever it was, I mean, we started, Justin, you remember, early day. in the we morning. We saw a camel. We saw a camel, a horse on a porch. <laughs> Um, that 11,000 square foot house. Oh, I forgot about that big house. Yeah, so we, we went through a lot. Mississippi was a wild ride. She, she was like, I don't know, it's like the, anyway, I'm not going to say what that was like. But my biggest takeaway hanging out that whole day was this is the same stuff that I'm doing, just a little bit more volume. Because what, we went on like 10 to 15 appointments that day? We were running. I think, we, I think me and Justin put almost 300 miles on we we were all over that day doing appointments we met a seller at the ihop we uh you know we were doing pre-foreclosure appointment we were door knocking we were being careful because we we're like we don't get the shotgun pulled on us but look i was like this is exactly what i'm doing right now it's just a few more and it's so one of the biggest things for me was the validation that what i was doing was the path to what i was wanting to get to it's you just have to change it well, but here's the thing. James Clear, the author of Atomic Habits, he says, um, he said, so many people want intensity. They want that big secret. They want that, you know, I'm going to train to do a marathon. But the reality is they just need to work. They need consistency, not intensity. They just need to maybe work out four times a week versus doing, you know, a, a, an Ironman or something like that, right? People sometimes want to go for the big home run, the big thing, when really what they need is just that consistency and that was probably one of the biggest takeaways I had that day. Somebody told me, uh, like really summed it up for me, what you're saying there, was think about when you're a kid, right? Like everybody dreamed of the superheroes, Superman, Spider-Man, Batman, <coughs> right? But as a kid, that ain't what you needed. You needed a dad, you needed a mom. You need somebody that was there every day, not wearing a cape, just being consistent and doing the, the necessary stuff over and over, the simple things. Right? I mean, that's the case. How many of y'all remember that? Everybody wanted a Superman, but at the end of the day, you look back, all your favorite memories are the little things that your parents did, the little things that your grandparents did. Um, it's the same thing here. If you want to be a hero in this business, do those little things every single day. You don't have to wear a cake. You don't have to do anything spectacular. Um, so, all right, so we're going to talk about some things that are, are not typically talked about. And I'm going to share with you the thing that I, it's hard to quantify this, um, but I, I think it's the single biggest thing that has made me more money than any other single thing. And so I want to ask a question. How many of you, and I'm very interactive by the way, so get loud, answer questions out loud. I'm going to ask you to raise your hands a lot. Uh, I might actually do a couple jump jacks. Who knows? Somebody comes in later. It's all right. He's got piece. books to give away. I do have, oh yeah, two more books. Uh, so let me just ask a question. By show of hands, how many of you have purchased a product or paid for a service that obviously you needed to some degree, but you purchased it from that person solely off of reputation? Mm -hmm. yeah, pretty much everybody. All right. So let's reset. Everybody's hands are down. How many of you have avoided a person or a business because of the reputation? Someone just came up to me about a deal. We were talking about a deal. When I found out who owned it, I immediately lost interest. 
because the family is so litigious that I, I knew that that was just a complete disaster of a deal from my history with that family. It's not worth it. Not worth it. Not right? worth it. So let's, I, I just want to ask a few people, what, let's pick a bomb and told somebody. Um, all right, you got the first book, I'm going to pick on you. What is, what is a reputation to you? Um, Either what is it, what does it mean to you, what are you striving for for your reputation, what is it? Like just to build trust and confidence in other people and based on your ability and the services that you can provide to them. People that believe in you. Okay. Who else? What is a reputation? Mm -hmm. uh, something that precedes you, uh, a sentiment, a thought, um, a notion above your character. I mean, that's spectacular. What's your name? Ivory. Ivory? Yeah. That's really, so keep going. It precedes you? Yeah. Um, whether good or bad, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, it's just the overall, um, it's just what someone or people think of you from your actions or inactions. So I'm gonna I'm gonna sum up what I say because you know Mississippi we're not always the smartest <laughs> or the best word. Um, my definition of your reputation is what the world perceives you to be before they've met you. Right. Close. So so think about that and you're spot on. Yours was much better. That's why I was looking for the website <laughs> version up there. Um, so I want to tell you guys what my aha moment was. So I remember my dad, obviously, I, how I looked up and, and drew him as a dad. I always joked that it was late on a Friday and that I was supposed to go somewhere else, but they were like, let's just put him with the Johnsons and get out of here for the day. Um, but I really did luck out. I have a phenomenal father, a great mom, and I remember my dad always telling me about, like, hey, you can, you can redo a lot of things in life. You can get a lot of things back that you've lost, but a reputation is typically not one of them, mm -hmm. right? And so when you're a kid, whatever, right? Like, oh, there it goes again. Um, but I'll tell you what my big aha moment was. I was 19 years old. I was in, it was after I started investing. This would have been spring of 03. Because I, I had started going to the courthouse. It was right after I got a, my first key to the courthouse. And um, literal so, key to the courthouse. Yeah, literal key to the courthouse. Because they kept having to kick me out at five o'clock when they would close. And I was like, oh, just give me a few more minutes, right? I, I didn't have the internet. I had to do it all in house. So I'm looking up stuff and I'm printing stuff off. And one day they came in and they were like, you want us to just give you a key? That's a key, like. And they said, yeah. I said, well, yeah, of course. When I was 19, they were giving me a key to the courthouse. Absolutely. Then I went around to all the other courthouses. I was like, hey, they give me a key. It'd be easier on everybody if you just give me a key. <laughs> they have like four or five keys to courthouses. Um, but I was in the courthouse one day, and I was talking to, it was the, the nephew of the chancery clerk. And we were talking, and, and he said, man, you know, oh, you're, you're Leon's son. I said, yes, sir, because I'm fairly new to the courthouse as far as just knowing everybody in there. And, and I'll never forget, he said, you know, he said, I like your dad a lot. And he said, I've realized that there's one thing I can say about your dad that I, I don't know that I can say anybody else about anybody else. You know, 19 years old, I'm like, well, this should be fun. You know, <laughs> what's this going to be about? And he said, you know, he said, I think your dad is the only person I have never heard anybody talk bad about. Mm -hmm. I'll think about that. Let that sink in for a minute. If your reputation was that I've never heard anybody even talk bad about you, that was a powerful, mm -hmm. powerful moment for me with regard to how important your reputation is. Now, think about this, right? Let's take it a step further in, into what that presents to you. How many doors can you open up if nobody talks bad about you? 
how many introductions can you get in a positive way when they say, man, I'll tell you what, let me introduce you to Courtney. She's the one person I, I don't know that I've ever heard anybody say anything bad about. So just wrap your, wrap your mind around that for just a little bit and think about that as we go through the, the next couple things that I want to go through. So I'm going to share a lot of stories with you. Uh, I, I know that those of you that have known me for a long time, we have story time with Adam. Um, but <clears throat> there's a few things. So those of you taking notes, I want, to write, I want you to write down a few things. So how do you get a good reputation, right? You said it earlier, be reliable. Right? So and let me just run through all these. Be reliable. Be respectful. Be recharging. And we'll get into what that means in just a minute. And then be rigorously authentic. Okay? Those four things will help you to build solid reputation if you do it correctly. And, and I encourage each of you, be yourselves in this thing. Now, if you're a shitty person, this is going to be real tough. <laughs> Not going to lie, let's be honest with each other, right? Rigorously authentic. If you're a bad person, tonight is not going to help you a lot. Uh, but if you're a genuinely good person, you like to do good deals with good people, and you want to do good business and build a good reputation off of the good things that you do, we're going to have a lot of fun tonight. So let's go through that. Be reliable. It starts with what you say, right? Honesty. If, you're, if the stuff that comes out of your mouth isn't reliable, you're done before you even get started. Mm -hmm. How many of you have somebody that tells you all kinds of stuff, and as soon as they open your mouth, you're like, no. Mm -mm. <laughs> right? We all know that person. We, well, we probably know one or two. Hold on, the guy from Nigeria whose grandfather <laughs> left him a million dollars, and he's now a hard money lender. That's number one. You can't listen to stuff that comes out of people's mouths that they just spout bull crap all the time. So number one with being reliable, it starts with everything that comes out of your mouth. That's from predictions, that's from your guesses on things, that's from advice you give to the stories you tell to general conversation around the water cooler. If you're spewing a bunch of bull crap, people are going to find out, you become unreliable, the rest of those don't matter reputation is not going to be good. All right? And then obviously it goes all the way into what you do. Do you follow through on what you're going to, what you say you're going to do? Do you do it well? Like, not only can somebody count on you to show up, can they count on you to do a good job at whatever you committed to do? All of those are equally important. We're in the real estate business. Let's relay this to contractors for a minute. How many contractors we got in here? Oh, we're going to pick on two people. Three. Is there three? Where's the third one? We got one, two. One, two. Oh, three in the back. Okay. So let me just ask y'all. I know the contractor business is notorious for the most upstanding, outstanding individuals in the world. <laughs> right? And I say this. I, I've been an insurance agent before, so y'all can pick on me afterwards. Um, but tell me this. How many times does a client or a customer, or whatever you want to call them, tell you that they've had a bad experience with a contractor? Everybody. And it was all because something they either said or did couldn't be relied upon. And usually it's both. Right? Reliability is definitely the top tier. That's, that's usually well, number that's, one. That's why Paul got out of the business from being a, um, a custom home builder because he could not guarantee that he would have the subs that he was willing to tie his name to. He literally, that was whenever he hung up his, his hat from doing custom builds. Because he, he didn't feel that they were reliable enough to stake his reputation on. He couldn't build a business out of it. So I have a hard time having somebody work for me with me. And tie your name to it, yeah. yeah. It's that reliability. So it all starts there. Consider that the foundation, right? I'm in the real estate business, so I'm going to use some little uh, analogies. Um, for those of y'all that didn't know, I didn't do well in English class. So, um, but if you're not reliable, like nothing else matters. That's the foundation to this whole thing. And if you're not reliable, the rest of it doesn't matter. Um, so the other thing, be respectful, right? How many of y'all have been around somebody that was just 
not respectful to you, to somebody else around you. I, I'm a firm believer that if I, I love to go to dinner with people. I love to do lunches with people. I love, I mean, obviously. I love to eat breakfast with people. But guess what? I want to see how they interact with staff most of the time. That's 99% of the reason I love to go eat with other people. You want to meet me? You want to go talk to me? You want to pick my brain? You want to talk about doing business together? We're going to go have a meal together. And I want to see how you interact with the waiter, the cooks, if we interact with them at all, the hostess. I want to know how you interact with all those folks that you don't think have any bearing on what it is that we're about to do. And that's always my first go-to. Because if you can't be respectful to the people that for all intents and purposes, have nothing to do with what we're about to meet about. If you can't be respectful to them, I don't trust you. And we're not going to do business together. Right? That's that's a huge one on my list. Consider that the frame on the foundation. So the other thing, be recharging. And I'm going to give some examples about these in just a minute. But one of the things that my dad used to talk about, and I, I was at a... Um, trying to think of what year this would have been. This would have been 2000. This would have also been 2002. We were at the old Grand Casino in Biloxi, the one with where Harris is now. They have the little Skywalk and everything. I met Sugar Ray there. He was doing a concert. We met each other in the Skywalk for a minute. Um, but I remember we were there for HR Block Convention. We had some franchises, and my dad got up to give this speech and they were talking about employees and how to deal with employees and how to, to build a good franchise office uh, and how to run it correctly. And the guy before my dad, I don't remember the guy's name, but he got up and he was talking about how basically he just runs it with an iron fist. And I mean, he had employees in there. It was almost embarrassing for us. I was sitting there going, oh man, we're gonna have a revolt here in just a minute. Because he was talking about how he didn't trust his employees to make good decisions, so he kept a close eye on them. He only paid them just about the minimum I feel like you could get away with paying somebody. And talked about how just basically you had to have your thumb on everybody the whole time. Right? Not a good way to start things out. So then my dad got up there, and and I was young at the time, but I remember he starts talking about buckets, and I was like, oh, what is he talking about buckets for? We're at a tax convention. And he starts talking, and he says, you know, he said, there's two ways to treat people. He said, you gotta consider everybody walking around carrying a bucket, and everybody's got a certain amount of water in it. And you've got two options. You can either fill that person's bucket up when you interact with them, or you can suck the water out of their bucket. Mm -hmm. and, and his whole speech that evening, or that day, was being a bucket dipper or a bucket filler. Now you translate that into batteries, right? We're all in the wireless world. We got electric vehicles coming out, and batteries this and batteries that. But the truth of it is, you all have been around people I mean, probably today, where you get around somebody and when you get done talking to them, they just have sucked the life out of them, right? How many of y'all have experienced that this week? You just, you interact with somebody, that person, that's, sometimes it's a seller, right? Sometimes it's an investor, sometimes it's a buyer, sometimes it's a friend or a relative or whoever, but just know, gosh, I'm going to run into them at church on Sunday. I'm going to call them back. They've called me three times, but I know when I call them, they're just going to drain every ounce of energy out of me. Right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? You can raise your hands too. It's okay. Um, now, how many of you, on the other hand, have the opposite of that? That person that just, man, they're contagious, and you can't wait to get around them because every time you get to just hang out with them and be around them and talk to them, they're so excited about life and they're interested in what you're doing, and they're talking about the deals that you're doing, and they want to know how you are, and they want to know how they can help you. And when you get done, you're just, man, like I was tired when I got here, but now I'm so excited. I'm so just energetic because I was around this person. Mm -hmm. I'll re 
recharging. So that's the third aspect. Be recharging for the people around you. Be that person that gives people more than what they came there with. It's very, I cannot stress that enough. Uh, the last thing is to be rigorously authentic. Now, I will tell you that is the most difficult thing. Um, most of us love to embellish ourselves. <coughs> most of us hate to talk about anything that we've screwed up in the past. That's just human nature. Fight it. Fight it a lot. That rigorous authenticity will open all the doors. So, and it's still difficult for me. But let me just tell you, in the spirit of rigorous authenticity, I used to have a Midas touch. I've shared this story a few times. Um, I used to have a Midas touch. I mean, I grew up around this stuff. My first trip to a house was a foreclosure. I went in a little car carrier. My mom cleaned it out. We rented it to the same tenant for 23 years. And that was my first experience in real estate. And I was in and out of houses, rehabbing stuff, going with my dad on appointments. And I mean, if I if I wanted to make money on this water bottle, done. And then one day, I started kind of losing my way from all that stuff, right? I, I kind of lost track of some of those principles. And I lost everything I had, 12 months. It was a, it, I think the total count that I came up with was it cost me about eight hundred and something thousand dollars. Um, I was semi-retired on top of the world, and I literally, in twelve less than twelve months, I got divorced. I lost two houses to foreclosure. I watched my car get towed away, not because it was broken down. For any of y'all, give me good. <laughs> <enough. laughs> um, and my credit score went from 790 to, I don't know how low they can go, but it was, I'm pretty sure it was below 500. And that's when you went into the, um, the Mima com cottage, right? That was right no. on the, that was right before. That was, yeah, that was about two years before. Mm -hmm. um, it was tough. It was really tough. And it was really tough for me to talk about that for a really long time. But guess what? How many of y'all have messed up before? Part of life. Don't be scared to share. And I'm going to tell you right now, one of the greatest things that you can do is share your failures with somebody else to keep them from going through the same thing. Mm -hmm. How many times has somebody shared their failure with you and it saved your life? Mm -hmm. Be rigorously often. Okay? All right. And I have to do this to stay on track. Otherwise, we'll be here till midnight. Um, so I do want to share a couple stories. So on being reliable, I want to tell you one thing, and, and this kind of goes with rigorously authentic. So we're working on a 40 house package deal. We've been working on it for about eight or, no, we're going on nine months now. Um, if you didn't have an ulcer before, you'd probably have one at this point in this deal. Yep. Um, it'll the be big deals usually do that. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is, I mean, in my almost 20 years, this is my single biggest deal to date. It's a lot. And it's a lot. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a lot payoff-wise, but it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So six weeks ago, we're 20... No, we're about 40-something hours out from closing the first four, right? We're, we're doing a staggered closeout. We do the inspection on the first four. We've got a buyer that's buying one as a rental. We've got another guy that's buying one as a rental. And we've got guys that are buying the rest of them out of out west. And they're counting on us to do the inspection on the first two. Both of them had twenty thousand dollars plus foundation issues. Oh my God. <laughs> Decisions to make. What do you do? 
So 10 minutes later, we get in the car, Brett and I go through it, and we say, hey, you know, let's just call them. <coughs> got to be reliable. And in this case, you got to be rigorously authentic. So we called them up. We said, hey, guys, we may have a no-go here. Right, and you got to, I mean, we put a lot of hours into this thing, a lot. And we're talking about a seller who had a carousel in her living room. <laughs> she had a Ferris wheel outside. She has a Herbie car. She has a 60 foot paddle boat that they had shipped down from the Lake of the Ozarks. Very eccentric, very fun and interesting to deal with. And now we've got a problem where 48 hours from closing. And we called them up and said, hey guys, I think we got a no go here. I don't think this, this is going to work for you. And if the rest of the houses look like this, we can't let you buy. Guess what we said? They said, we knew you, we liked you guys for a reason. We we're actually talking to our lender about opening a branch there so we can buy all of the houses from y'all. And if we have to buy those to make the deal work, we'll do it. Thanks for being honest. Right? But let me tell you what, you want to talk about being puckered up while the phone was ringing? <laughs> but do what you know you should do. And do it fast. It's easier just to rip that Band-Aid off and get after it. And most of the time, you'd be pleasantly surprised by the outcome. If it does, and if not, if they just said, hey, guys, no go, hey, we did the right thing, and at least we kept the window open to do business later. We safeguarded our reputation because we safeguarded how reliable we were. Um, so, <clears throat> all right, that's one thing. The other one, the, the being respectful part, I want to tell y'all a funny story that just, it still mind boggles me. I don't remember this lady really at all. Um, I used to, before the world went real crazy, I used to love just stopping on the side of the road and helping people. Like, somebody broke down, hey, let me pull over and help you. That was my charitable day, right? I love to just stop and help whoever. It's, a, it's I think it's early August, so it's about this time, this is probably 20 years ago. And uh, I'm going south of Hattiesburg on 49, and there's a, like a, it's a big body something, like a Crown Vic or a Grand Marquis or something like that. I pulled over on the side of the road, a town car or something. And they got a flat tire. So I pull over, it's two older ladies. Of course, this is back in the day. Is there ain't really a cell phone? It's so hot. Pull over, change their tire. My brother and my dad pulled up behind me because they saw my truck. Of course, they were dressed nicer than I was. I was like, y'all don't need to help. We got it. So we changed the tire 17 years later. So this was this was about 20 years ago. No, this would have been, let me back up. This would have been about 17 years ago. And this, so it would have been about two years ago I talked to this lady, so 15 years after the fact. I'm at a, I'm at a, like a book release party and I'm walking out and a lady looks at me and she goes, do you drive a green truck? <laughs> no man, you must have the wrong person. She said, well this, this was a long time ago. Did you used to drive a green truck? Like a little green truck. <laughs> yeah, like 15 years ago, you know. And she goes, I thought that was you. And I was like, oh God. <laughs> and I was like, what is that? <laughs> And, uh, and she goes, she goes, you helped me and my friend change a flat tire one time. So then me and dad got introduced to all kinds of people just from that one, like the author, and just opened up a whole new network of people because of, in my mind, it was respecting my elders, right? I don't want my grandma changing a flat tire. I don't want your grandma changing a flat tire. I'll jump out there and do it. And because I did it, we opened up a whole new network of people just from one small, like, respectful act to somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, I can't stress that enough. You never know what those little things will, will do for you. All right, so let's go to the next one. Anybody have any questions, concerns, disagreements? 
Um, right, I cannot so, tell you how many times that your dad um, has shared stories of it's things, how you guys have been reliable on past deals that have helped you get current deals because so-and-so, remember the park, the situation in the park, and he had that one tenant that he could have taken his deposit, but he instead gave it back to him, and he ended up being the family member of the guy who owned the park. Oh, and he called him right there. Right there on the spot. On, on your dad's meeting. phone. So let me, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Let me tell you all this story. So we go look at this moment. It's okay. Park. You start learning the stories, right? Yeah. So, so we go look at this mobile home park, and we, I looked at it like eight or nine months before. It was priced way too high. Well, then I get a phone call from the realtor, which was Chandler. That's mm -hmm. how we met Chandler. And so the realtor called me and said, hey, I think they're coming closer into your ballpark. Do you want to take a serious look at it? And I said, yeah. Can you put me in the same room with them and let me do my own talking? He said, yeah, I don't mind that. So he sets it up, which that impressed me to start with. Um, nothing against you realtors out there. Um, but that's always one of my things. I want to do my own negotiation. Put me in the room with seller. And so he puts us in a room. We start talking. And, of course, Dad is immediately, he's going to find mutual connections, common interests, all kinds of stuff. We'll come to find out this guy's nephew had rented from my dad. And he didn't stay the full lease like nine out of 12 months. Guess what the lease says? You can get your deposit back. But this guy was a great tenant. He paid on time. He communicated, hey, look, I've, I've got to move. He even said, I'll pay out the rest of my lease if I need to, but I still have to move. And dad said, look, you've been great. Just clean everything up when you go. Pay out through the end of the month. I'll give you your deposit back. It's not a big deal. Well, come full circle, it was this guy's nephew. So before we left, they were ready to finance it, zero down. Your dad on the spot was like, made the connection by... Oh, he called the guy. Hey, hold on. And he pulls yeah. up, that's your nephew? That's your nephew? Hey, do you mind? I'm right here standing next to your uncle. And hands him the phone. <laughs> hey, tell him about me. <laughs> and no, he does. This guy, and then he goes and tells him how, how he treated him. And it was great, right? How many of y'all want to buy a mobile home park with no money down? Mm -hmm. There's a recipe. Write it down. It's that simple. You've got to get, and, and it's all about reputation. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what that whole thing came back to. Nothing down mobile home park deal, all about reputation. Because mm -hmm. when we sat down, like most buyer-seller sit-downs, that first little bit was pretty apprehensive. Right? Everybody's on edge. Oh, are they going to get the best of me? Are we going to get the best of them? Let's, oh, oh, don't say that. Oh, be on your guard. Oh, hand them the phone. Hey, ask them about me. And when that phone conversation got done, totally different meeting from then on out. Just because of that connection. Because he had done something. He was reliable. He was respectful to somebody else. Does good business. He did good business with somebody, regardless of what the paperwork said. Right? All those things always come back around. And sometimes they come back around more than once. Um, so I want to tell you all a story about the two drastically different outcomes from the same exact situation. So about how long ago was it that we went to buy that land at the foreclosure sale? Three months ago? Oh, yeah. Two and a half months ago. So we're looking, we watch the foreclosures. We don't buy a ton of them anymore, but we kind of watch for what's coming up. And, I mean, to be fair, there hasn't been just a tremendous amount of them. Um, but we had some land pop up. And it was about four and a half good acres. Um, pretty beaten up, but oh, like mostly okay house in the very back. The opening bid was, was it 30? 35. Or 35, maybe? 35. So, I mean, we're pretty excited. We call down, we get the opening bid. The guy says, yeah. He said, I think I've had one other guy call. And we're like, okay, we, this might work. So we show up, and when we get there, there's a guy standing there. And how many of y'all have done foreclosure sales? Okay, so I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you. 
There's three people that show up at foreclosure sales. Not over here, bro. But okay. Is there a bunch of them? Yeah. Keep going. So there, typically there's three, or I should say three types of people that show up. There's the people that are there to buy or to bid, right? And they have a certain way they carry themselves. There's people that show up because they're curious to see what a foreclosure sale is going to look like. And there's a certain way they carry themselves. And then there's always, if, if they show up, there's that person that has some kind of a personal interest in that property. And there's a very distinct way that they carry themselves. And typically that look is that they have something to lose because they do, right? So a guy comes up to us and I can tell by his body language, I'm like, this guy's got a personal interest in this property. And he says, are y'all here to do the sale? And I said, well, there's a few here today. Uh, I said, no, we're not here to do a sale, but we're here to bid on one. Which one are you here for? And he gives us the property that we're there for. I said, all right. I said, well, tell me about it. He said, man, I live next door. That was my aunt's property. My two, was my two cousins were supposed to pay it off with your life insurance money. Now they're <clears> both <throat> dead. And I found out that they're about to foreclose on this land and I never had a chance to, to get it, and I really want to keep it. He's, and we pulled it up on land buyer. He owned the property next door, the property on the other side of it, and his family owned the property behind it. Man, all right. I said, well, did you come with the money? And he said, well, I have a letter from the bank that says I can pay up to 60 grand. I said, okay. I said, can you get a certified check? Because I don't think they're going to let you bid and buy with a letter. And he goes, man, my bank's on the coast. I don't think I can get there and back in time. Mm -hmm. I said, you probably can't because they're doing the sale in 45 minutes. So here's what we told him. I said, look, man, if they let you buy it, I'm not going to bid it. If they don't let you buy it, I will buy it. I'll give you 30 days to pay me back. And depending on what I pay for it, I need a little extra for my money. Two to $5,000, depending on what I pay for it. I said, I don't, if I'm in your shoes, I want a shot to get that land back. Right? I mean, if you're in his shoes, don't you want somebody to get you a shot of getting your family land back? That's what I thought. And so I told him, I said, well, look, there's typically three people that show up at these things. And I'm surprised they're not here yet. He said, oh, he said, I already know which three. We've called all three of them, and all three of them said that they weren't going to show up because they know the situation. I said, wow, that's pretty impressive because one of those, I'm surprised, won't show up. Sure enough, guess what happens? One of the guys said he wouldn't show up. He shows up. And he walks in, and he's got a check for the opening bid plus a dollar. You know why? Because in the phone conversation, they had told not only how much, but they told him they were bringing a letter saying that they had the money and he knew they couldn't bid it. So he shows up to get it for a dollar over. So we sit down there, we wait. This guy goes, when he finds out that we're there, this, uh, what do we call him? We'll say his initials are A-H. You can fill in the blanks from there. <laughs> so A-H, realizes that we're there and we're going to bid on it to try to get it back to this guy. <clears throat> he goes to the bank and gets another check for 80 grand oh. and comes back and buys that property. The whole time telling us how awful we are because the guy losing it was like a son to him. But had his fair shot to keep it. Now, fast forward a few months. We've already gotten a good handful of leads from the guy that lost his house. Because guess what he does? He helps people that are getting foreclosed on. You think that's a good lead source? We didn't know any of this when we were just doing what we were doing. We were trying to be respectful. Right? That's all we were trying to do. Be respectful and be helpful. And so since then... We've gotten a good handful of leads, more leads coming in. We made a phenomenal contact in the county, which none of that matters anyway. 
right? It doesn't matter. That's just icing on the cake for us doing what we wish somebody would have done for us. And it's really, the simple thing is, it's as easy as the golden rule. Everybody knows the golden rule? Yeah. I'm not real sure it made it to Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> Should we all say it together? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. He warned uh, you in Sunday school. Yeah, Sunday school, that's right. Uh, I don't know, you got about 15. Sure hey, you've got about 15. Uh, 15 minutes? Oh, God. I'm going to speed up to one and a half times. All right, so here we go. Um, so there's a few things when it comes to reputation. Obviously, we could talk for hours and hours. There's a few things that I do want to leave you with, especially now that we're running low on time and then open it up if anybody's got any questions. Um, one of the biggest pieces of advice I can give you is to stay extremely vigilant when it comes to your reputation. Uh, if you are not actively building and preserving it, it will naturally erode on its own. Okay? If you're going to write something about reputation down tonight, write that down. If you're not actively building and preserving it, it will erode on its own. Um, so, and then don't just apply that to real estate. Apply that to every area of your life. Right? Do it with your spouse. Do it with your kids. Do it with your friends. Do it with your family. And if you find somebody that you don't want to apply that to, they shouldn't be in your life to start with. Right? I'll save you some trouble there. Be around the right people and follow those principles. And just apply that to every aspect of your life. Um, let's see. Anybody? Oh, and if anybody wants to stay in touch with me, I'm Adam Justin Johnson on Facebook. I am big. something on Instagram, uh, Big Sip Real Estate on Instagram, and I'm on LinkedIn, but I don't, it's Adam Johnson. There may be a Justin in there, I don't know. Um, but you're welcome to shoot me a message, connect with me, or if you want to really get in touch with me, AdamJ1600 at AOL.com. That's a real true story. Um, any questions? I'll, I'll, I can wrap it up. That way we've got a few minutes for questions. Yeah, no, and I think that some of you guys may gloss over this, but this is huge. There are deals that I have done strictly on reputation alone. Um, there are deals where I've sat in the living room when the seller was getting other offers from people in this room. And they were just like, but they just came in here talking about this, this, and that instead of, you know, um, you know, listening and paying attention to the situation. And so it's how you treat them and, and things like that. Um, we sat in someone's living room this morning facing foreclosure, and she said, I want to, you know, what's your role in this? I said, look, we're one of the options. We can buy this, but I want you to make an informed decision for your family. This is what it would look like if you listed it. This is what you, I want you to know all your options. Afterwards, she texted me. She's like, thank you so much for your time because it allowed her to answer some of those big questions, you know, about her situation, what the bank might do, this and that. So it's how you do one thing is how you do everything. Ooh, that's a big one. Mm -hmm. that, did y'all hear what she just said? Yeah. How you do one thing is how you do everything. The reason why this is really important is for those of you who don't know, there have been the real estate industry is really small. There was people who were in um, a certain part of Mississippi that we were starting to vet to do deals with. They uh, they did something not right on on a transaction. They burned someone, and before the transact the day ended, someone gave me a phone call. Hey. You should know X, Y, Z happened. Um, I know you were looking at putting some money into a transaction with them. And before the deed was recorded at the courthouse, I had gotten that phone call and I had to have a hard conversation with them. And I didn't, I was like, damn, that, that was fast. That was faster than Amazon could have got it to me. You know what I mean? <laughs> but like the reality is, is your reputation. Here's the thing is, you know, <clears throat> there is no amount of money that I can make on one deal that is worth what my reputation is worth to me. Like his dad said, there's many things in life you can get back. Your reputation is one of the ones that you rarely can get back. And so it's huge. And that's the Simon Sinek, the infinite game concept. It's it, thinking long. And it might be different if it was 100 years ago. 
But, it, you, I mean, the internet's right there. You can't run from it anymore. They even got it in Carnes, Mississippi now. I'm telling you, it's everywhere. <laughs> right? But, I mean, 140 years ago, right? I mean, we had somebody in our family tree that we couldn't get past. Turns out they weren't a Johnson. They were something else, killed somebody in Atlanta, moved to Mississippi, decided they were a Johnson. <laughs> right? They can run from stuff. We can't do it. Yeah. Well, and it's huge. It's huge. The idea is, if you're in this for a quick buck, what's, what's the point of your reputation? But if you're in this for the long game, y'all, I plan on having these for 30 more years, right? These meetings. That's why, look, there's, there's um, you know, I was on the, I was doing a weekly huddle with Cole, and I'm in the freaking thrift store. If you don't know me, that's a personal, like, that's how Courtney goes and finds her sanity. Um, I'm just walking around doing our weekly huddle, and this old woman comes up, and she's like, I'm so sorry. Is your last name Fricky? I'm like, Grandma in Metairie. You know, like, I couldn't get away from it, right? So you don't know. You know, you truly, you just don't know what it looks like. I went and was door knocking pre foreclosures um, on, a, on a house in Madisonville, and uh, we eventually. You know, I, uh, I left something on the door. Someone calls me. She's like, yeah, we're going to meet you at the property. The mom has dementia, so it's the daughter-in-law who met me. And she's just smiling. She says um, she worked at one of the local brokerages in the area. I said, oh, really? I, I do some trainings there. Without anything, she calls me back the next time. She said, I didn't tell you this, but I went and um, talked to one of the some of the agents there, and they told me, you can do, do if, if Courtney is there to help you, do any deal with her. They had four different properties, not just that one property. And they just, they started talking to us about, about them all. Commercial property on one of the biggest, uh, you know, main streets in Mandeville. Um, more than 10 acres somewhere else. She said, oh, is Courtney's helping you on this deal? I'll let her help you with anything and everything. I'd do a deal, do with, deal with her all day long. You want to know what that meant on the deal? That meant she, she immediately, there was no negotiation like this. And I should have stood up a second ago. There's no negotiation like this. Like there's going to be a winner and a loser. It now was, we're sitting on the same side of the table. And so that's huge. That's huge. There's a, you reminded me of a story. I'm not going to say the name of who it is, but um, so a friend of ours, He's older, very seasoned investor, very successful. Probably has, if I had to guess, probably four to five hundred free and clear rental houses. Um, he, well, let me ask you this: How many of y'all would love to show up at your office, sit there, and buy four or five houses a month because people come in because they know you buy houses in your credit? Like, no advertising, no marketing. Look, that, like everyone here, right? In like, if all I have to do is sit in my office and they come to me 45 and no marketing, nothing like that, come on. I'll do that so all day my long. first time in this guy's office, he had three people just stop by. Mm -hmm. He bought two of the houses. First day. The first day. Now, it's because he has been religiously building a good reputation. Because he's a good person. But he made sure that he did things the right way and really paid attention to what kind of reputation he was building. And, and I'm, I'm going to end it with a really fun thing that happened. Same guy. He's running late for a flight. He pulls up to the airport at the front door. He's by himself. Parks his truck. Leaves it running. Goes and gets on his flight. Did it on purpose, by the way, because he was running late. He knew it. He didn't forget it was running. He knew what he was doing. Went inside. Guess what security does? Called his wife. Said, hey, your husband let this truck out front again. We need somebody to come get it. We turn it off. The keys are inside. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, that's the kind of stuff. You buy houses. You get great parking spots. Have a good reputation. You get valet at the airport. Anybody have any questions or anything like that?
No, I did that good. I'm getting real good at this. <laughs> So I'll, I'll, does anyone have any questions, guys? You don't. It can be real estate related. It can be reputation. Go ahead. Hey, when you said you were writing the um, the letters back in the day to the foreclosures, you said you would write them out to mail them, but you would leave the addresses blank. What do you mean by that? Uh, so I'll tell you exactly what the letter format was. At the very top, on the left, and this was on yellow like notepads. Like legal pad. Legal pad with a blue pen. Uh, that was where I splurged. I bought G twos. Um, I would put my name, so like Adam Johnson, my box number, and my phone number at the top, and then I would skip about six lines, and that, and then I would put their name, mailing address, and then I put dear and leave a blank. Right, and I'm blanking out what like specific information is going in, and then on the letter I would put I may be interested in purchasing your property at. I would skip three lines leave one for the address to write in and put, please give me a call at your earliest convenience. If I don't answer, please leave me a message. And then I put my name and my phone number in, and that was it. So I'd sit there and do that, watching TV till two in the morning, just doing a whole legal pad. I'd do a page and flip it, do a page and flip it, do a page and flip it, do a page and flip it. And then when I got whatever I was gonna mail, right, when I went and took my key to the courthouse, and pulled some lists out, I would go in and just fill it in, fill out the envelopes, send it out. But that, that was it, very simple. And then the, the key to all that is handwritten, um, envelope, hand addressed, real stamp. But you did a very targeted small list, right? Very targeted, yeah, I mean, you're talking 150, I might have mailed 250. Um, and they were very specific, like certain tax delinquents on certain neighborhoods that I loved, right? Certain ones that were out-of-state owners in areas that I loved, and I knew they had owned it for 10 plus years. But this was all stuff, like this was not a list source pool, this was in the courthouse. Is it 250 a week or 250 a month? A month, a month, I'm sorry. I might have mailed 250 in a month. Typically it was 150, um, but I was getting 20 to 22% response. Just huge. Um, any other questions? All right. Um, few, oh, yeah, books, books, yeah. You see, it's hard, right? It's so difficult. Um, hmm. Nehemiah, help me come up with a question to give a book away. Come up front, help me. <laughs> hey everybody, meet me and mine. It's hard, right? <laughs> it just said, what you talking about? <laughs> uh, let's see. Because we're going back to uh, one of your stories. Uh, what did Mr. Leon do for the tenant that was in the trailer? In the warehouse. Yeah, warehouse. He gave him back his deposit, even though he kept It's hard, right? <laughs> Thanks, Nehemiah. Uh, all right, let's do one more. And we're going to have somebody, if you know it, first one to raise your hand. What are the four cornerstones? <laughs> There's someone out there who's just building like reputation. She was, she's that one on Family Feud. Reliable, respectful, recharging, and rigorously awesome. Again, so first of all, Jen, can you tell people about the book club? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Jen, can you tell about the book club? Yeah, the book club. It's a Warren Buffett book, it's a good one.
a book a month? Yeah, and so we read a book a month, and so usually we, like I said, it's every Thursday, um, and so then I'll send out what, what, what your chapters are reading, and then like I said, we'll kind of discuss it. We usually have pre-planned questions, and um, yeah, we'd love to have you join. She does a spectacular does. Yep. job. I mean, spectacular. Excellent. All right, guys, before we go ahead and uh, wrap this up, any other questions for Adam? They can be, you know, real estate related, ref, you know, what he talked about tonight. Look, some of the stuff that he talked about tonight, guys, I literally cannot put a price tag on what he talked about. Uh, it's been huge. Um, when it comes to doing deals, I've been, I've been doing deals for, I got in the industry in 2014. Um, and then I started, I did my first deal January of 2016. Um, so, you know, I've not been in, you know, 10 years in the industry, um, but I can tell you, I've seen what it looks like when your reputation stops you. And I've also seen what it looks like for it to help you. It's huge. Um, it can open or shut a door. It absolutely faster can. Faster than anything I've ever seen. No, it, it absolutely, absolutely has. Um, I'm, I'm heading to Atlanta tomorrow morning. For those of you on Clubhouse, they've got the Clubhouse Live Conference in Atlanta. Uh, any of you guys going to that? Okay, so um, they have the, the conference for Clubhouse Live, and there are some people I'm very strategically having lunches and meetings with who um, I've been vetting out their reputation. They've reached out to me, hey, wanna do deals, wanna fund your deals, things like that. Um, I've been vetting them out, now it's time to go meet them out in person and have lunch. You know, Eric Bryant just moved to Atlanta. I'm not. Yeah, I need oh, to get you. I'm not gonna say, I'm yeah. gonna say hey to him. Uh, but, so it's huge, um, it's huge. <laughs> Look, Adam Adam has brought some great value to you. You guys enjoy the stories? Yes. Yes. There's things that I learned from the stories that it may not be the whole point of the story, but I'm like, man. Look, I'm dealing with that tenant that passed away, right? Dealing with their family. Look, the paperwork, I, there's, there's things that I can really push through with the paperwork right now. But man, there's some things I'm like, okay, hey, I went back with you know my team and I was like, look, there's some options we have here. You know, I can go be the person who um, flexes hard right up front. And there's been days when I've had to be that person, right? But there's opportunities when you don't have to as well um, and lead with it. But thank you so much, man. Always a pleasure. Let's give it a crowd. <laughs>